they were deflecting the blame is right. the point. Yeah. Rather than own up to the fact that they did not properly disclose their alliance and their commercial relationship with the freaking soda lobby. Yeah, right. They deflected and they pointed the finger back at the influencers who were calling them out. Luke Cook, what up? Welcome back. Yes. Back for the, so I mean, it feels like the third time this year. Maybe I'm back. I think it probably is. Yeah, wow. Yeah, but I love it. I love reoccurring Luke Cook. That's it. That's yeah. it, daddy. I just want to keep coming back here. Love it. Um, how's life with you? Life is pretty good. Yeah. Can't complain. What's your favorite podcast in the last month that you've released? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I did one with this guy, Sean O'Mara, or mm -hmm. O'Mara, mm -hmm. who talked all about visceral fat, and it was like a oh. two-hour-long master class on the, on the dangers associated with visceral adiposity. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is this the one that I think I wanted to look it up? Was there something about ad when you lose fat adiposity, the changes to the face? Yeah. Okay. He, he talks a lot about that, about how visceral fat, um, people who accumulate a lot of visceral fat seem to also ha take on this edematous look of the face, which is essentially water retention mm -hmm. in the face, mm -hmm. um, probably associated with inflammation. We know that visceral fat, uh, releases in pro-inflammatory cytokines mm -hmm. and um, part of the inflammatory, I guess, cascade, a component of it is water retention, Yeah, perhaps. And so it, it's like you start to store water in places that you wouldn't otherwise. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it was a super interesting. I think that it was, you know, one good idea for the podcast that we should do at some point or talk about is doing like a bit of a fact check because we have a lot of guests on and sometimes the ideas that they present, I know that my listeners would probably love this. Yeah. They there are opposing viewpoints that yeah. are that are occasionally presented, right? And um, I do my best to push back sometimes, but it would be cool to kind of like go into each episode and be like, what was accurate? What do we maybe not so much agree with? Yeah, or what do we not really know? Yeah, but I do look at your comments from time to time because, and I don't know how you do it honestly, because people don't push back on anything that I post because I don't really post anything that that's that, that's that controversial but people push back on you so I always know that looking at your comments is going to be a fun time <laughs> like the other day you posted something about protein and someone was uh, in regards to muscles and some guy was like carbs are better for, for muscles than protein <laughs> and I was like but I'd love to know I, I'm, I'm like that is I think I'm pretty sure that's wrong but I'd love to know where he got that information from mm. like I'm so intrigued by who where did you hear that from yeah. Like, it's amazing. Where do you think people hear that from? There are definitely some, some interesting pockets on the internet that uh, where misinformation, I think, is allowed to foment. And, and the more it's allowed to um, it, it would sort of develop, foment, develop within these, within these echo chambers, mm -hmm. right, the, the more extreme that misinformation gets. And so there are, I think... I think this guy probably has spent some time in those vegan vegan echo chambers mm. where some will argue that you know all the protein that you need can be attained from eating like just fruit. You know, they're like fruitarian vegans. Right. So all the growth that your muscle needs like M because mTOR is activated by carbohydrates. Is that right? Yeah, and energy in general. Right. Um energy intake and uh and yeah, and carbohydrates because of the f fact that Glucose yielding carbohydrates spike insulin. Insulin mm -hmm. activates mTOR. So, do, do carbohydrates have the ability to grow muscles? They don't uh, grow muscle, but they do play an anti-catabolic role. And, right. and carbohydrates are muscle sparing. Right. So, this is a actually super interesting conversation that I had with Sal De Stefano from Mind Pump recently. Mm -hmm. That the worst diet in the world to be on for muscle growth and and ultimately muscle retention would be a low protein, low carbohydrate diet. Oh, wow. Because you're not ingesting adequate protein and carbohydrates otherwise play a protein sparing role. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you were in a pinch and you couldn't access protein, eat carbs because carbs are muscle sparing. Right. Interesting. But like a, if you look at like a traditional, the way it's like defined in the medical literature, ketogenic diet, which mm -hmm. is, which is traditionally defined as a lower protein, low protein diet mm. with obviously negli negli negligible carbohydrates because of, you know, it's a ketogenic diet. That's probably the worst diet for muscle retention. Yeah. Interesting. I was listening to Don Lehman talk the other day and I'm going to bring him up later um, about how muscles are fueled by fat. Does that make sense to you? Well, low intensity exercise, the fuel substrate that fuels that kind of activity is primarily fat. 
Yes. And it's the higher intensity exercise where carbohydrates play a really useful. Role. Right. That's why CrossFit athletes are like carb freaks. Yeah. That's all they do is eat carbohydrates. What's your What's your diet currently like? You eating carbs? I've started measuring my food for the yeah. first time ever. It's it's wild and tracking it. You know, so I went to my son's birthday the other day and I was like, this sucks. Like, how am I going to track this? Like, mm. how am I going to? And so I was like, this is actually annoying. Like <laughs> at home, you can control the elements. And so you can be aware of, you know, well, how am I going to measure it? All the stuff I'm, I'm giving to myself. But then I was at my son's, you know, there's a platter, like a cheese platter. It's like, you're stuffed here. You, you don't yeah. know. You have no way of knowing. Exactly. But what's interesting about that is, uh, is what you posted the other day, uh, this meme that was like, 20% of nutritionals, like there's a 20%, they can be wrong on nutritional packets. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're allowed to be wrong up to 20%, which is Allegedly. just wild to me. Yeah. Are you using a food scale or what? Using a food scale and my fitness pal. Nice. Very, uh, I think I was, I thought I was eating more. I found it much, I found it really easy to eat less. Mm. Uh, particularly by watching my fat intake, you know, added oils, cooking with oil, cutting that back has just been like, I'm like, oh, this is actually and being aware of how much calories are in fat. So for instance, I would just eat macadamia nuts and I was like, I was looking at the calories in those things when I put them into my fitness pal and I was like, wow, most of my calories in a day are coming from fat mm. due to these macadamia nuts, just like smashing them. And like two handfuls, it was like 400 calories. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's like a quarter of my calorie intake. Yeah. You know? So it's been really interesting to cut back and go into a deficit. And I've never really done that before in such a measured way. Yeah. yeah. I think I've been a lot more um, bearish, to, to borrow a term from the stock market, uh, in the past on calorie tracking. And I, I don't think it's a, a thing. I don't think it's it's meant to be something that you do for the long term. But if you've never audited, like 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 you just illustrated, if you've mm -hmm. never audited your food intake before, it can be a very illuminating experience. Yeah. And to use a food scale and to use a calorie tracking app like MyFitnessPal, which I've used, it's mm -hmm. great, um, can be very informative. Yeah. Also, I'm hitting like much more protein than I ever thought. I've always been aiming for 200 grams in my head and I've discovered that I'm actually hitting like more like 240, 250. Wow. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot. Mm. But also it's interesting to see at the end of the day, like what is, I mean, I, I, I thought I was a low carb guy. I'm not a low carb guy. I'm actually a fair bit of carbs. Yeah. I mean, cause I love fruit. Yeah. That's so, great. Yeah. I've been eating carbs. What do you been eating? Um, I do, well, pre-workout, I've, I've been doing some like some overnight oats that I make and I mix some uh, casein protein into, which mm -hmm. I love. And then um, post-workout, generally I go to this place close to my house and I get like a steak plate, which tends to come with, or I order it with, with steamed broccoli to get Sick. that fiber and some white rice. So Sick. I'm, yeah, so it's like a nice. Have you seen the DIAAS score of casein? It's like no. 150. Is it? It's like one of the highest, like digestible, indispensable amino acid score. Yeah, I'm impressed you know that. Um, the casein is like the highest. Wow. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, and I, I guess it's interesting because it's a slower release protein. Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. It's uh, it like it. I think it it congeals in the stomach. Okay. It's not like whey. You know, you're an, you're like a whey protein expert. At this yeah. Point. I mean, whey is incredibly quickly digested. Yeah. Sometimes I, I heard Menno. Menno, what's isn't that his name? What's his Menno, last name? Yeah. But he was just saying the other day that whey can be too quickly absorbed by the mm. body. And so that you aren't in muscle protein synthesis for long enough because mm. that it's too quickly digested. Interesting. Which I thought was really interesting. So if you mi mixed casein in with your whey, it would slow down the digestion of the whey. Yeah. Or even added a bit of fat. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you could have an egg with it. Yeah. That's an idea. Yeah. I think the best times to use whey, I mean, ultimately, I think the just hitting your protein goal regardless of source, I think is really probably the most important variable. But if you really wanted to be ultra, you know, uh, specific about protein timing and, and the different kinds of protein that there are and the best use case scenarios, I think whey is probably best post-workout mm -hmm. and post uh, waking up. So I like to yeah. break a fast with because it's so rapidly absorbed. Yeah. Um, speaking of oatmeal, I thought we could start with this. <laughs> I know you have organic oatmeal, but I wanted to talk about this. Bayer has been sued and they have lost to, they lost, they have to pay out $1.56 billion Jeez. to four plaintiffs wow. for Roundup. Hmm. And what's crazy about this story is that these people were using it at home. They're not farmers. They're not gardeners. They're not like, you know, they don't work at a, at a school, been a gardener. 
they're just people who use it around the garden at home. They mm. use Roundup, which is 41% glyphosate. And what's wild to me is that this is something you can go and buy at Home Depot. You can go and buy glyphosate at Home Depot and people are using it just to kill weeds. And <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Like, I just think that's a great lesson. But what's wild about Bayer is because they bought Monsanto, who created or uh, own uh, Roundup. And they're saying it doesn't cause cancer, despite having to give out, like, I think, like $11 billion ever since they took on Monsanto a few years ago. $11 billion in 100,000 cases. Insane. Uh, is that they just don't think it's cancerous. They just stick into their guns. Yeah. Yeah. Stick into their guns. Absolutely wild. It's so crazy to me that that people will just use this stuff occupationally in and around their homes and ultimately ingest it by way of food that they know has a high probability of being contaminated with glyphosate. Yeah. And just trust that Bayer has their back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like a pharmaceutical that buys an agricultural company like Monsanto and you go kind of like, okay, so you can cause the sickness with these pesticides and also provide the, they're getting you from both ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, they're just yeah. like Eiffel towering you from, <laughs> from both ends. Yeah. That's what we call a pig on a spit. <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd to me. You know, this the, here, I have like a, a, a crazy anecdote. Well, so I have no, I have no reason to um, suspect that my mom's illness was due to exposure to some kind of, you know, herbicide or pesticide. But I will say that growing up, my mom had a, my mom had a Parkinsonian-like condition, and there are certain um, herbicides and pesticides that are associated with dramatically increased risk for Parkinson's disease. Mm. We don't know why people develop Parkinson's disease. There's not a ton of evidence on it, but. It's one of the sort of le leading theories as to why Parkinson's disease develops is due to some sort of to toxin exposure. Mm -hmm. And my mom, you know, who was otherwise very healthful, you know, very, very health conscious throughout her life, she had a garden growing up because um, we had a house on the eastern tip of Long Island. And mm -hmm. so we would go out there every weekend. And my mom had this garden that she would every summer she would tend to. And I just remember we would buy all kinds of, we, we had a weed problem in the garden. And so I have no idea what it was that my mom was using in that garden. Yep. This was like well before I had any concept of, you know, what these kinds of chemicals were and what they did. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but it's, it's very possible that my mom at some point was exposed to occupational levels of some kind of toxin. Yeah. Um, were she to have chosen to use like a Roundup, for example, because she was growing like tomatoes, she was growing all kinds of things in that garden that we would routinely eat. Yeah. Um, but she was in it. She was like literally like in the in the weeds, so to speak. So wow. I have no idea. I don't know if she had any kind of exposure, but it's, uh, it's possible. Well, I want to say because it, it's actually, so I went into the history a little bit and found out as much as I could about glyphosate, but this is what I think a science direct said about it. The ubiquitous presence, presence of glyphosate in food, water, and air means that it is regularly ingested. Mm -hmm. It is virtually present everywhere in the food chain. For instance, residue testing in the UK Food Standards Agency conducted in October 2012 found glyphosate residues in 27 out of 109 samples of bread. Mm -hmm. They also contaminate drinking water via rainwater, surface runoff, and leaching into groundwater. I think basically it is nearly impossible to avoid. Yeah. At this point, it's been used so much. I don't think I don't think it's found in meat, though. Ah, I, mean, I think this is yeah. one of the arguments that carnivore advocates mm. will use to, especially in the context of the modern food supply, right? Mm -hmm. Used to promote the, the their diets is that when you eat when you base your diet around meat, you're not really ingesting very much glyphosate, if any at all. Right. Well, I guess there's no need to kill weeds if cows eat them. So yeah. you don't need to spray glyphosate exactly. anywhere exactly. near it. Exactly. Um, looking into the history, it's actually amazing. So um, what they were, glyphosate, what they found was the guy patented it. He didn't really have a use for it. Maybe he, he invented it and it, 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 um, it could clean metal. But then they just found, found out that you could kill weeds with it, but you couldn't just kill weeds with it. You killed everything. Mm. Everything died in its presence. Jesus. So they were spraying it, you know, after they'd, when there was too many weeds coming up after they'd already picked crops. And then, then it got, you know, Roundup got bought by Monsanto. And then they started Roundup, uh, essentially foods that 
could withstand Roundup round, ready crops. Roundup ready crops. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. like canola, soy, all this <laughs> stuff. And you go, isn't that wild that you had to invent a type of seed or a type of food that could withstand this thing that killed everything? Mm. And what's the food that can withstand a chemical that can kill everything? <laughs> Like, what's that food? Yeah, right. You know, it's so weird. Not something that you probably want to routinely ingest. I don't think that these were developed with malicious intent. I mean, no. you know, these, like, they had to dramatically scale up crop production at the turn of the century and beyond, right, to, to mm-hmm. support a growing, a rapidly growing population. But, I mean, science evolves, and now we have all this, you know, data. We know more about the chemical and there's and also with all the commercial interest that goes into it and publication bias, right? Like glyphosate, people on social media, you know, these like scientists that seem to be apologists for any number of industrial chemicals on, mm-hmm. on social media, right? Like they'll they'll say that they'll they'll say things like glyphosate is the most studied chemical mm. ever, you mm. know. But it's like there's still publication bias, like. You know, only the studies that show no harm, like th- those are the ones that are more likely to get published. Right. Right. I think they are They are using glyphosate for other things. They're using it in medications and things like that that I had no idea about. I mm. just assumed that it was just a weed killer. Um, they use it to dry oats and stuff. Yes. Yeah, which want, is, yeah as a desiccant. Um, I wonder if they're drying the oats that are, you know, that withstand Roundup. So they're using Roundup on Roundup ready crops. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. And I'm actually, I guess I'm confused about its legality in the in the EU. Do you mm. know anything about this? I don't. I like, wouldn't know. I thought yeah. that it was banned in the EU, but yeah. apparently it's not. Like, apparently there's st- much stricter regulation surrounding it in the right. EU. Yep. But it's not, ba- to say that it's, apparently to say that it's banned in the EU is is not accurate. I don't understand the fact that, e- that the EU bans all this stuff that's my question is like is that a good thing because i hear from people in the eu like when they banned lab-grown meat the, it, it, italy banned lab-grown meat and a lot of people wrote to me when i posted that and go isn't this great a lot of people were like actually no it's not great because this prime minister is a like a, an asshole mm. and it's like he's been a fascist <laughs> and so in a way i'm like yeah because he's taking away your option for food which i don't like and i don't want the other side to do that to us where they're like you can't eat cows anymore mm. Uh, so, but I wonder, is the EU, like, are we cool with this thing where they take away the ability of us to eat certain foods or chemicals? Like, is it a good thing, do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm generally pro small government and less regulation, but I also think that humans are a fallible species. And when you let the market decide, you get things like, the ubiquity of glyphosate, for mm. example, or you get these, you know, mer- you get a food supply that's 73% ultra processed. Yeah. And so, you know, do I think like we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that cigarettes are deadly? Does mm-hmm. that mean that I think cigarettes should be illegal? No. So that's where I think it's, it's really, um, it's a gray area, right? Like I think ultimately people should be able to decide what it, what, what it is they, that they choose to ingest. But yeah. Maybe, maybe we just need to have more, honesty with regard to marketing um maybe honesty with regard to like what yeah what these conglomerates are allowed to you know advertise on tv Mm -hmm. um whether or not they're allowed to fund scientific journals for example or place you know advertisements within those journals so i don't really know i don't know what the solution is i think um I think the best solution is just education, it's continue, continuing to have these conversations. Yeah. You know, and for people that are open minded enough to gravitate to listening to podcasts like this mm-hmm. and conversations like this, let them make their own informed decisions. You know, that you know, did you know uh, America is banning menthol cigarettes? I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. A majority of people who smoke menthol cigarettes are African Americans, which presents the problem of like, okay, well, why menthols? People don't die from the menthol. Right. You know, that's not, menthol's not killing people. Right. You know, the cigarettes themselves are. So why ban menthols? Interesting. And it's, and it's a Democrat pushed idea. And so it's like, so why would you want to further criminalize people who just like leave them alone? And how are you going to enforce it? Yeah. Like, are cops going to come around to your house if you're smoking a menthol? That is so weird. Yeah. I could understand banning a flavor that maybe children gravitate to. Right. Grape or something. Yeah. But yeah. like menthol. Yeah, you're right. Menthol is not the boogeyman here. Yeah. It's, it, 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 honestly, I, when I heard that decision, I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I, Wild. I just think like it sounds 
actionably like they're trying to do something that's very stupid and yeah. that will you know further isolate a community that feels that like they're already been isolated yeah you know yeah wild and all these like fast food companies preferentially will market to african-american populations mm. and, um but yeah i think it's like I think I think the marketing is the issue. It's like who is being targeted, you know. But right. Then, but then again, like, do I think that there should be regulation around that? I don't know. Like, yeah. market to whoever you want. Speaking of big government, let's talk about. We, last time we talked about influencers who have been paid by Big Sugar to say that aspartame is okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. So. It seems like the well, who is it the 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 federal regulators announced warnings against two major food and beverage industry groups and a dozen nutrition influencers. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, all those people that we mentioned last time, we didn't even mention them by name, but all those influencers got letters from the federal regulators that was basically like you didn't tell people, you didn't let people know well enough that you were being paid by the American Beverage Association or Canada Sugar. Dude, this was so awesome because when that story broke. A lot of us that are fighting for, you know, truth with regard to nutrition um, and and more transparency in the world of nutrition, um, broke the news on this story after it after it came out in the Washington Post, mm -hmm. right? That a lot of these highly credentialed individuals online, registered dietitians, physicians, were being paid off by the soda lobby to promote aspartame. Mm. We talked about it on social media, and then that whole credentialist tribe got up in arms about the fact that they were being called out on something that they were rightfully being called out about. Yeah. But then they put the blame back on the Washington Post and the wellness influencers who were calling them out mm. by saying things like wellness influencers are hypocrites, you know, and granted, I'm sure some are. You yeah. Know? But, um, but they were deflecting the blame is right. the point. Yeah. Rather than own up to the fact that they did not properly disclose their alliance and their commercial relationship with the freaking soda lobby. Yeah, right. They deflected and they pointed the finger back at the influencers who were calling them out, right? Yes, yes. Which was really fucked up, right? Talk about like lack of accountability and ownership, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that story kind of came and went, right? Adding obviously to the to the, the 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 canon, the growing canon of evidence showing us the interrelationship, this like really um, unfortunate intertwining of industry and health, like you know the 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 healthcare and the world of healthcare, right? Yeah, and the information, like, and the information, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then like three weeks later, again coming out in the in the Washington Post, the FTC actually sent warning letters to not just the soda lobby, but all of those influencers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, no matter how much you want to defend yourself for having promoted aspartame, which like, okay, fine, maybe the evidence is not as damning with regard to aspartame as some in the wellness world may make it out to be. Mm -hmm. Still, very few of these, you know, it's not like, getting warned by the FTC is, not a small deal. Yeah. Like that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, you were warned by the FTC for unethical community, you know, sci health communication practices online. Yeah. Like if I think for some of these people and I watched the videos, just, just saying like, I think the who's wrong here. I don't think that there is enough evidence to say that aspartame is not good, but then having it paid for by big beverage, yeah. which, they're not, they don't want the best for the world. No. The American Beverage Association don't want the best for the world. And so it's like, uh, you know, and some of these people were, they, they'd written paid partnership, but not with who. Some of them had written paid partnership with who, but didn't mention it. Part of the FTC letters was like, you didn't mention in the video that you were being paid to, to make this statement. And you need to be much more forthcoming. Paid partnership, Ameribev, isn't enough. You need to say, I'm being paid to, I'm being paid this part of this is I'm being paid by American Beverage in the video, yeah. right? Because people aren't necessarily reading it or they're not even reading the captions. One of the letters was like, you put ad all the way down the bottom. You need to put it at the top mm. and you didn't do that. And these people, and, and that's what amazes me is like, you're a doctor. You, you should know that this is unethical. Yeah. Like, you know, that you shouldn't be giving health advice and being paid to do so by, you know, an association that doesn't give a shit about people's health. Exactly. Yeah. And that doctor... Um, has said that 
Well, he was. Well, I'm just basically sharing evidence based information that I would be sharing anyway, mm-hmm. regardless of the partnership. Right. But nonetheless, if you're taking money. As a health and science professional, you have to make that disclosure. Right. You would have to make that disclosure where you're pre- presenting at a scientific conference. You would have to make that disclosure where you're publishing in the scientific literature. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, to be reaching civilians via social media, millions of civilians via social media, I think that the responsibility is, is if anything, stronger, you know, that, that you should be disclosing transparently like where your funding is coming from and as you said yeah the soda lobby has blood on their hands yeah i mean like yeah they make diet sodas and they make water bottled water and things like that but like sugar sweetened beverages are a massive problem yeah a massive public health issue yeah and so yeah i think uh i i saw because i looked for their videos from america Amer- <laughs> Maribev and aspartame and i wanted to see and there was a comment that was like hey uh you were you paid by american beverage to make this <laughs> statement and the doctor goes, yes, I was. Um, and the guy goes, oh, this is really disappointing. I, I, I can't believe that you took money from them. He goes, you know, the disappointment is mine. I don't get paid very much as a doctor. And I'm like, I don't feel sorry for you. Mm. <laughs> wow. I'm like, I'm like you're, a, you're a doctor. I, I, this isn't a Crimea River moment. Correct. You know. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, it's a freaking problem. And like, look, nobody's perfect, right? Like, I'm sure that... You know, I, there are products that I enjoy, that I have commercial relationships with, mm-hmm. and not every mention of the product uh, is going to be precluded with a hashtag, I'm sponsored by this product, because my exposure to a product by way of this commercial relationship is going to mean that I have I will have developed a likeness for it, right? Because yeah. it's something that I use routinely. Um that Zevi has pointed very well towards the <laughs> well, they absolutely don't. nailed the placement of that. <laughs> Zevia, sponsor us. <laughs> they're not, we don't work with Zevia. But they're good though, aren't they? It is tasty, yeah. It's, it doesn't, it's kind of, kind of take a, if you don't mind me talking about Zevia for no. a minute, it's kind of rich and delicious. It almost tastes like it could be bad for you. Yeah. And Who I, knows? Yeah, I wonder if there's no calories. No there. calories. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, they allege. It's a nice little treat, you know? It is. What do you think about Stevia? I'm interested to know. Some people will say that it's got endocrine disrupting potential, but mm-hmm. I haven't seen any. I mean, I, granted, I haven't like looked too yeah. deeply for that evidence, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's probably fine in reasonable doses. A Zevia dose. A Zevia dose. Yeah, I don't drink. Ver- <laughs> I mean, I have at most one a day of these things. Yep. So I well, somebody reached out. You know, I posted our first thing for Shakewell, which we're yet to launch. We launch in January, but somebody already was like, "Is there stevia in it?" And somebody was like, "Yeah, is there monk fruit?" And they were already like, there better not be stevia or monk fruit in there. And I'm like, wow, I, just, I thought they would be widely accepted as something that's okay. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend, my friends uh, created the ice cream brand Holy Scoops. Oh, yeah. yeah Do you yeah. know Holy Scoops? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And they they tell me that people are super concerned about erythritol, which they use in their product, which is like a, a sugar alcohol. So it's like you can't win today. No, There's so yeah. much, I think, like so much fear mongering on social media and so much misinformation that people are afraid of everything. Yes. Which I think is a big big issue yeah and i've been is. leaning more into trying to help dispel the fear that people have you know yeah yeah fear mongering on social media is a great way to garner attention yes and um and i and i think so that's like where a lot of people that are trying to build their platform will first kind of you know lean into into the fear mongering and then there's yeah. the people who are like don't be fear mongered everything's okay in moderation <laughs> but it's like that's not necessarily the way to go either like there exactly. are some things like are very hard to eat moderately. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, I thought we could also talk about, because Joe Rogan recently posted, your mate, Joe Rogan. My mate. Um, he posted a, a screenshot of a news article of a, a catfish that had been turned female no. by Japanese researchers. Damn. Uh, this is amazing. That poor fish. <laughs> well, here's what they were, why they were doing it. They catfish were doing it spends because- his whole life thinking it's like a dude. And then <laughs> yeah. some scientists intervene. Yeah. We don't care about the souls of that kind of fish <laughs> yeah. at all. But here's why fish. they're doing it. That they, were discuss- that they found that, well, if we're going to farm raise fish in order to eat them, females get bigger quicker so that we can, you know, we can eat them in a shorter period of time without, without having to feed them for more months. And more yield. So that if they could turn males into females, then they could make them get quicker, bigger. Hmm. 
bigger, quicker. Uh, they used isoflavone from a compound found in soybeans Oof. that are similar in effect to female hormones to create the all fish groups of catfish. So they had a whole bunch of tanks, 500 fish in each. First one was just fresh water. The other ones had varying degrees of the isoflavones in it. And then one of them just had straight up female hormone in it. Right? Wow. So all of the fish in a certain level of isoflavone became female. <laughs> the same level in just the female hormone one. They all became female. They are unable to sell fish for human consumption at this point, but they were like, this is very interesting. Hmm. You know, so they may look into doing it later. Damn. But it really got me thinking about, <laughs> well, if there is a, uh, a hormone disrupting uh, compound in our drinking water, how would it affect us. So I looked into this and it turns out it's already happening. In the UK and the US, more than 80% of the male bass fish in Washington's major river are now exhibiting female traits such as egg production because of a toxic stew of pollutants, scientists and campaigners reported yesterday. Uh, this is in 2012. The, the chemicals could include birth control pills and other drugs, toiletries, especially those with fragrances, products such as tissues treated with act antibacterial agents or good treated with flame, uh, with flame retardants and find their way into wastewater. So, and 5 million people who live in greater Washington drink from this water, of which 80% of the male bass have become... That's terrifying female well did you ever listen to shauna swan on, on rogan speaking of rogan no she's a i think she's like a, to, a, a toxicologist i believe but she sounded the alarm on that episode of the show which was a couple of years ago now about the the uh our, our chronic exposure to these uh endocrine disrupting compounds mm -hmm. the, the the you know whether phthalates i think she was primarily talking about phthalates but bisphenols parabens and the like just the never-ending barrage that your average human today experiences from the time that they're conceived, yep, you know, up until the time that they expire, it's wreaking havoc on our hormones to the degree that development is now being affected. I mean, the the EPA, I believe, uh, it was either the EPA or the Environmental Working Group, identified just below three hundred industrial compounds. So these are not these are xenobiotic compounds in utero, like in. I think placental um, fluid or mm, whatever mm. Uh, that your that your average newborn today in the United States is exposed to in utero, mm. um, and so on this episode of the show, she was talking about the fact that one of the consequences, one of the probably many many consequences, but one that they could easily measure is that it's reducing the anogenital distance in boys, which mm. is basically the distance. Again, it's sort of like grip strength, so it's like something very easy to measure, but probably is. Uh, uh, I mean, it's concerning in and of itself, but it's probably also a surrogate for all these other changes that are happening in us biologically. Mm -hmm. The distance between in boys between the anus and the balls, which are like, I mean, the that's tank. the perineum, the taint. The notcha. Yeah, yeah. Not your balls, not your anus. <laughs> the notcha, yeah. <laughs> but if you think about it, like if you think about the, the length of the perineum in females, it's obviously very mm -hmm. short. In boys, I mean, it's like it's it's so it's shrinking, so it's actually wow. feminizing mm. our genitalia, mm -hmm. and um, and all due to you know was what she proposed to our exposure to these kinds of compounds that apparently is able to turn the gender of fish seriously and actually really uh, effing up the like the ecosystem in these freshwater water systems. Dude, I think gender dysphoria, man, is a is a consequence of like I think it's it's to me in my view it's it's. A form of mental illness, mm -hmm. and and I don't I don't I think we should destigmatize it. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think that you know obviously there's a social contagion aspect to it, which is highly problematic. But I think for some people that genuinely do experience, we'll say idiopathic gender dysphoria, right? Yeah. Like without any other cause, mm -hmm. I think it's very likely to be the case that it's due to some exposure. You know, some kind of to environmental. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we know that sexual orientation is influenced by hormones um, during development. Sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, who knows? it would be it would be stupid to think that it, that that environmental pollutants don't play some like any environment has any effect on you. Of course, they have an effect on you. Furthermore, I just think, I think there's a social aspect to it that 
I think that the idea of toxic masculinity has perforated into society where we're like any type of masculinity is bad mm. and so the natural of femininity uh, uh, you know feminization of men is to you know is to appease that and so so there's a social aspect and there probably is an environmental aspect which you're talking about yeah yeah and, and then you, it blew my mind reading all this shit yeah and then you put everybody on on low protein diets high in ultra processed foods high in added sugars and right. things like that right and then what do you moist? I always think about the moisturizer because you think about what you're spreading all over your skin, Ooh, one yeah. of your largest organs that there is every day. What's in that that's just sitting on you all day? Yeah, probably not good. There was another, something that my friend Chris Masterjohn posted on Twitter um, was, was super interesting. He just posted this and he's a nutrition expert. He's a PhD in nutrition. You know that beef intake in this country has... First of all, testosterone rates are on, testosterone is on the decline mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. in men. And beef intake, which is one of the primary and most important sources of zinc, which plays a very important role in testosterone mm -hmm. production, is on the, de on the decline as well because we're eating less beef, mm. you know? Wow. And so that could be one of the reasons why, you know, why we're seeing lower rates of testosterone on top of all the exposures you know, to these xenoestrogen compounds. Yeah. Speaking of the uh, the beef thing, um, I wanted to talk about red meat yeah. causing type 2 diabetes, um, which Harvard did this study. The, the 216,000 participants from the nurses' health study. Now, I had no idea about this, the idea of uh, the way that... So the way that they do it with these participants... Uh, they assessed their food frequency with questionnaires every two to four years <laughs> for up to 36 years. Uh, and, and more than 22,000 participants developed type 2 diabetes. I, I find that so funny that every two to four years they'll ask what they ate. Yeah. And that's the only way that they've done this study. Absurd. What's it called? Epidemiology? Is yeah. that what it's called? Yeah. And it's because uh, I, I looked into it because I was listening to, as I said, this guy, Don Lehman, who you know is a master of protein. And he was like, epidemiology means nothing. Like he goes, when we do our research, which is uh, clinical studies, they go, they, they make sure that they give them the food mm. so that they know what they're going to eat mm -hmm. and they monitor what they eat. They don't just go, what did you eat yesterday? This yeah. retrospective or like, what did you eat a year ago? Yeah. That's madness. You're never going to get anything good out of that. Exactly. Anyway, so it's funny that these people have come out and said, red meat increases risk uh, of type 2 diabetes by 46%. 65% of the protein in the American diet comes from animal sources. That means every single person should have type 2 diabetes. Ooh, yeah. I mean, it's so it's so insane. But that's the kind of like fake vegan science that makes headlines. Mm -hmm. And it serves as confirmation bias for all of the many forces trying to, you know, get you to eat these higher margin, lower protein foods. Mm -hmm. And um, and those kinds of studies were, are, are not meant to change behavior. Mm. They're meant to generate hypotheses that are then studied you know, as you, as you alluded to, in the clinic with randomized controlled trials. Right, right. And there was actually a study published in 2020. I, uh, I pulled this up. It was a systematic review of randomized control trials, right? So the difference between a randomized control trial and the kind of study that, you know, Harvard put out, which made all the headlines, is that the, it's only the randomized control trial that can prove cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. Because you take a group and you... You know, you split them in two. One serves the control group, and the other serves the intervention group, and you and you compare the two at the end of the intervention, right? So the control group are the ones that you change their lifestyle a little bit. You do something different. The other group maybe remains the same. The control correct? group remains the same. Yes, yeah. okay, they're controlled, right? And then you compare them against the intervention group, mm. and you try as best as you can to have it be placebo controlled. Okay, you know, yeah, double blinded, which means that both the subject participants as well as the researchers are blinded ah. to the intervention, yep. right? So it doesn't create bias and, um, and that you have a good sham control, which is another way of saying like the placebo, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, with meat, for example, it's a little bit harder con to control for, you know, meat consumption and to, uh, try and to eliminate a placebo effect because it's pretty black and white whether or not you're eating meat. But they can basically feed you uh, a food item with the same amount of protein, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, so this systematic review of randomized control trials 
and by the way, observational studies. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No. So this was a, t actually, this was a 2020 systematic review mm -hmm. and meta-analysis of RCTs. So RCTs only. So the kind of study to that can actually prove cause and effect published in the, by the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that red meat intake does not significantly impact most glycemic and insulinemic risk factors for type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, again, these are the kinds of studies that we need to be looking at. Yeah. So uh, a meta-analysis is looking at randomized controlled trials, it's looking at a number of different trials and kind of comparing them. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, ra uh, the, the, way to, the best way to think about it is like it's a study of studies. Right. Ah, uh, yeah. That's yeah. Right. It's a meta-analysis. It's a meta-analysis. Okay, this is yeah. cool to know because I've never understood what the hell that people are talking about when they say meta-analysis. Meta yeah, there's a lot of different kinds of studies out there. I mean, people can look up reviews. Reviews are, are generally, uh, they're easier to read. They're like, you know, you can find like what's called a narrative review, which is basically like, um, the, just the, the, the most, uh, plain English way still being an academic paper, but, um, to kind of read the lay of the land with regard to a certain topic. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's important to kind of know the difference between all these different kinds of studies, right? Because if yes. you don't know the difference, then somebody might show you one of these epidemiologic studies and say, oh, red meat increases the risk of type two diabetes by 20%. But risk, you know, is correlation. Like risk is always correlation. So when you see the word risk, you know, correlation does not equal causation. You right. need a randomized control trial to ascertain whether or not the connection is causal or just happenstance. Yeah. Um, I was listening, I, I, apparently there's this guy, Will Willett. Have you heard about this person? He's the author of Eat Lancet. Yes. And apparently he's- Walter Willett. Walter Willett. Yeah. Wal Walter Willett. Um, he's like the head of nutrition at Harvard. Right. He's got a long standing bias for plant based eating, yes. veganism. Funded by many of these plant-based, you know, ultra-processed food companies. Mm -hmm. Walter Willett, yes. So, so Don Lehman was saying, if if the epidemiolo if the epidemiology studies and the randomized control trials don't agree, then you have to ask why. And when Harvard doesn't do randomized control trials to back it up and continue to publish data without doing that testing, you have to look at agendas. And that's what he was saying about Walter Willett, who mm. was this guy who Shots was a, fired. Yeah, the author of Eat Lancet, who encouraged people to eat more sugar than protein. Mm. And then this was published in The Guardian, who according to this Don, to Don, Don Lehman, they've been funded by groups who are anti-cattle. And according to him, they've sold their soul. Whoa. Yeah. And by the way, Don Lehman is, uh, he's legit. Not only is, is he the scientific mentor to Gabrielle Lyon, mm -hmm. who, um, you know, many people, many listeners of the show will be familiar with, but also Lane Norton. He was he ah. was a scientific like mentor to him. Yeah, wow. Early on, yeah. Cool. Now, he's a fascinating guy, very softly spoken. And like, I love listening to him talk about food. But also, he doesn't talk with agendas. Yeah. He's like, you know, he's, he goes on vegan podcasts and talks about protein there, but he's just like, he's not interested in having the carnivore vegan debate. Yeah. He's just not interested in it at all. He's just such a scientist. Love it. Um, he said also, fiber and photo, phytochemicals are very important. Unfortunately, the average American gets 70% of their calories from plant-based foods right now, mm. but it's crap. It's low fiber. It's highly processed, which provides no nutrient, just excess calories. Yep. And I thought that was, that nails it. Yeah. You know? hundred percent. I mean, most people are eating predominantly ultra processed foods. If you take, if you take what little animal products, you know, they're, it is that they're already consuming and you deplete, you deprive them of those products further. You, you deplete their diets of, of like high quality protein even further than, than they already are. Mm -hmm. and it's just a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not, not cool. Not cool. Harvard. Yeah. Let's talk about losing gains when using your phone in between sets. I thought this was so funny. Apparently it creates what symptoms of depression or something or like that's entirely possible. I th mm. think that's just social media in general. Interesting. But Insta Instagramming before your sets reduces lifting performance. The study mm. finds the researchers had strength trained men perform a workout to failure after either being on social media for 30 minutes or after a control condition. The control condition was they made them watch a NASA documentary in between sets. Social media use led to a significant increase in mental fatigue and decrease in how many reps they could do, resulting in a 15% lower volume load. Hmm. So the, but the people who did the NASA, who watched the documentary from NASA, had no difference. Interesting. Yeah, so listening to educational content 
could be a good idea in between sets, but watching trash, not. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, I guess it it depletes your cognitive resources, which are really yeah. important with regard to training, at you know to adequate training volume. I don't know. I mean, I, I know that taking longer rests in between sets is actually not is actually thought to be uh, generally beneficial. Yep. Um, in the past, I think there was a little bit of like it, w people believed that the shorter sets actually increased, led to increased intensity. Mm -hmm. um, and you could per maybe get like a bit of an aerobic cardiovascular stimulus from it. Yep. But now we know that recovering adequately between sets just means that you're able to lift more intensely, which actually is beneficial from the standpoint of like the the anabolic stimulus. Right. So a longer rest period can actually be beneficial. Totally. Um, but I guess looking at social media, which is something that is, you know, Ev everywhere, everywhere. We, we do it. You know, that, what I was thinking of is that, okay, we do it in the gym and it's mentally fatiguing. It's always mentally fatiguing us then because we're always yeah. looking at it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's such a double edged sword, you know, it's like great on the one hand, like, it's where we go to find hel your hilarious content, right? Uh, you know, I try, yeah. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's also, I think that comes at a cost, you know? Like, my, my explore page is just like a dumpster fire of shit that I don't want to see. Right, but I get stuck there. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's good, isn't it? What is it? What do you tend to, what, like, if I looked at your explore page right now, what yep. would I see? Uh, it'd be health content, acting content. And every so often there's titties. <laughs> <laughs> Can't avoid. Which you can't that. avoid, but yeah. that, but it knows. Like sometimes like it's just like, oh, there's like, it, it knows that I'm like, oh, sometimes I just got to have a look at that. Like, what is that? That looks just fascinating, you know? <laughs> totally. Because if I go to Cara's, my wife, so it's like fashion, <laughs> models, the females, it's so much harder for women, I reckon. Dude, it's the I pressure to be like skinny and hot. On Ugh. social media? Yeah, it's bad. Sucks. And for men too, I think that body image, you know, is definitely body image issues is definitely growing amongst men thanks to social media. Yeah, you actually, know? the the guy who posted that study, Menno, has done a similar study on on that uh, body dysmorphia and social media. So next time I come on here, I'll have that information. We can talk about that. Have you ever come across Sam Sulek? No. Does his name ring a bell to you at all? Yeah, dude, he's a phenomenon on YouTube. He's like the, the biggest name right now, like in the fitness industry. Okay. He's this 21 year old kid who's jacked beyond belief. Right. And he does these long form videos on YouTube mm -hmm. without any fanfare, no fancy cutting, no sound effects. Like his videos are really unique in, uh, you know, in the context of the YouTube landscape right now where everybody's trying to become more cinematic and mm. one up the other with, you know, higher production value. Yep. His is just straight to camera, very low production value. Mm. Him typically, like a typical Sam Sulek video is him driving to the gym mm. and talking to the camera like about what he intends to do in the gym. And um, and you can, one of the things that's so compelling about him is that it's so clear how much he loves just lifting weights right. and getting jacked and yeah. getting that pump, you know? And it's just so refreshing mm. and, and so inspiring. Like he, he's become this like really inspirational force. He's like, he's massive and I'm not, he's, he's definitely augmented, but like right. beyond that, his passion for lifting is just like so great to like, and that's to. what's inspirational. Do you think is this like a guy who loves doing what he loves to do? And well, he's he also he's re for a t for a twenty one year old. He's like really really smart, and he mm. knows what he's talking about. He's mm -hmm. like really smart, knows what he's talking about, and just kind of walks you through. Like we all kind of have like this internal monologue of like going to the gym and how we're feeling and what we intend to do in the gym. But he like is very good at externalizing, yeah, and verbalizing like his thought processes. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and he, I, I wish I was twenty one and I figured that out. Yeah. Like right? if I if I was like driven at the gym and I was like I knew what I was gonna do and I yeah. knew a lot. My God, he's he'll be unstoppable. Unstoppable in ten years. But the, I, have I seen something about him? Did he recently get told to not film in the gym? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Is, is that him? He does film. He just sets up the camera and he films himself doing sets. And he's like, like he's also known for his uh, his like workout style in the sense that he goes really intense, but then he. Um, He's very aware, which I think is like really important to, you know, this, the, the new science about um, 
maximal tension in the stretched position. Okay. You know, yep, like he'll do full range of motion lifts, but then with every lift, he like, he does these partials. Okay. Yeah. And, he's just uh, looking to get that pump on. He's just looking to get that pump. Wow. Yeah. And he just talks you through the whole thing. And he's okay. Like, yeah. And, and he's and telling you what he's doing scene. exactly yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And every day, a new 30 to 40 minute video. Of wow. Him just like lifting. You could probably just use him as a coach. Do you think he's doing stuff that's good for just like hypertrophy? Is he, do you think he's taking other stuff? Do you think he's taking on testosterone or do you think he's on? A- for sure. Oh, but okay. No judgment. No judgment. But also if somebody's going to follow along and you're not on those things, it's not ideal. For instance, like well, just doing a chest day. Yeah. But I don't think it, I don't think it, I don't think it matters. I think like most, first of all, I, I, I don't know whether or not he's been transparent about that. Right. But it's like a lot of these guys, like, you know, you can't compete on the Olympia stage without right. being augmented. Does that mean that that these guys are not able to be inspiring to a general population? Totally. Like they still are super competitive and dedicated and exhibit crazy discipline and true. You know, and and a mastery over the science of what it is that they're doing. Right, the true. applied science of bodybuilding. And yeah. So I don't necessarily fault them unless they're like in the case of Liver King, who's being, who's being. Very yeah. clearly deceptive. Yes, yes, yes. Right. I'm looking forward to playing with testosterone. Jacking yourself life. up. Yeah. Just, just like having a, you know, an incredible 50s. Yeah. You know, where I'm like, you know what? Now I'm going to take testosterone and I'm going to have a great 10 years on it. Yeah. You know, are you ever going to do it? May I mean, I, I have no need to do it right now. I wouldn't uh, no, me preclude neither. myself from doing it in the future. But um, yeah, no, I mean, why not? If if I get to that point, I will do it without, uh, you know, without any shame. Or yeah. Oh, whatever. I think it looks like so much fun. Yeah. We have some friends who do it. Yeah. They look. They they having a great time. They look incredible. Better living through chemistry. What was that? Better living through chemistry and science and yeah. you know, like why yeah. Not? It look, and there's so much going on in that space. Peptides and stuff. It's mm-hmm. like you could you could yeah. I would try some peptides. I've experimented with like a handful. I can't say that I felt anything. Mm-hmm. from what i tried um but i tried i think probably the weaker yeah. forms of the peptides that i tried me too yeah. ipamorel and i tried yeah all yeah. like oral you know which yes. apparently is not as good yeah probably not as good you got to inject it in order to feel like you're really doing something yeah exactly <laughs> exactly uh i want to finish on this but i it's, it's a sad place to finish but education loss during covid mm. it was absolutely wild there was a new york times article also a harvard study Students students experience a significant decline in learning during the pandemic. Duh. Damn. In the most affluent communities in the U.S., on average, kids didn't really fall behind that much. But in the poorest and highest minority places, it's as if they didn't have any schooling for the better part of a year. This researcher Reardon said, there's a real possibility these adverse effects could be permanent. When he and other researchers looked at the past 10 years of test scores, he found that when third and fourth graders fell behind, they were still well behind into the eighth grade. Unless we have some sustained systemic efforts, you sort of bake in that extra inequality into this cohort going forward. And he said, like everyone, he said, a big problem is that people want to get back to normal, but actually we need to get, we need to, we need to like double their maths classes. We need to have shorter holiday breaks extend the school year because kids have missed out on a lot of learning. So making the, the kids pandemic. pay. Exactly. I'm like, surely more maths isn't going to be helpful. Yeah. Like that would just cause me more mental anxiety. Wow. He did mention also that like we should be helping kids with the fact that we've gone through this pandemic and it was really hard. But I think that inna- innately like we failed them. Yeah. You know, we failed these kids. And like, I was so grateful that my son was never old enough to have to put a mask on. I would hate for him to ever have to wear a mask. But when he went to when he went to daycare, my son, like he went in with teachers, like so we were letting him go off with these teachers who are masked. I'm like, where does he think he's going? Mm. And who does he think those those people are? Yeah. You know, it's like just a really terrible time for kids. Oh, dude. I awful. feel sorry for them, maybe and people in their early twenties the most. Mm. Like losing three years of your youth. Yeah. You know. I feel like if you are not reckoning with the fact that just the insurmountable amount number of mistakes that were made during mm-hmm. 2020, and most likely, you know, many people that I know, even close friends, were complicit. They were like promoting, you know, and and like they, you know, I had friends that like 
unfollowed me because of my my stance, you know, right. on, on COVID. Like, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's like irrefutable that that lockdowns were, uh, you know, likely more harm than good. The mandates that we imposed on our children mm-hmm. more harm than good. Yep. Um, the education loss is just a very measurable way of going. We really messed up. We really screwed up. And also like, and then you look at addictions, which is very measurable too. And the amount of people who have committed suicide in the last however many years, three years. And it's crazy. Yeah. And you know, it's not a small amount. It's like that. I saw, is it um, Cigar? Hmm. He posted that today. Is it Cigar? You know what I'm talking about? In, uh, Indian guy, he's a news guy. He was on Rogan a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I have no idea, but... Cigar, anyway. He's posted today about, about the levels of you know uh, addictions and suicides hmm. in the past three years. And it's absolutely crazy. Wow. And it is most definitely due to the lockdown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, definitely not an, an area where I've like, uh, where I've done too deep a dive, but... Um, my friend, Kevin Bass, do you know Kevin Bass? Yeah, I've heard of him. He, I've had him on the show in the past and we talked primarily about, about nutrition, which is when I first met him, he was, uh, that's primarily what his, he was, he's a, he was an MD and PhD student. He attained his PhD. So now he's a, he's going through medical school, but he's completely turned his focus on, um, basically writing the wrongs mm. of the past three years and just mm. shining a light, right? Because sunlight is the best disinfectant on all the mistakes that were made and all of the hypocrisy mm-hmm. and all of the, you know, the pseudoscience that was that was used for political gain during that time at the expense of the, not just the American people, but people globally. Yeah. And, um, and it's just, it's such a shame. Yeah, it is. And today, you know, I heard it's, I, I love this guy named Professor Galloway. He was on mm. Bill Maher recently, and I'm a fan of him. But he's a big, he's a huge Democrat. But he said, you know, I wanted lockdowns to be harsher on, on schools. And he goes, I was wrong. Wow. But we need to, you know, know that we were doing the best with what information we had. And, you know, whilst I love him, I was like, no. Yeah. I don't think it's good enough. I don't think that you can. Why? Why would you? In not knowing any the information enough, go, let's be really harsh mm. first. It's like, no, how about we ease into it? Amen. You know, how about we, you know? And so I, I I understand that people aren't willing to forgive that moment in time. It was like the, one of the hardest parts of, I think, all of our lives mm. is that three year, this three year period. It was really hard. Yeah. You know, and I think um, there's a recency bias where it's, it's easy to uh, forget how hard it was, but it was pretty fucking, pretty freaking hard. Wow. The, the social pressures, the social weirdness that all of a sudden we were all arguing about masks, vaccines, all this stuff. Um, and, and the judgment. The judgment. I mean, you lost friends. I lost friends too. Just over the COVID thing, you mm. know, just over like what I thought about it. You yeah. Know? And uh, that's when you lose friends, that shit is sad. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I mean, when I had COVID, it was not a walk in the park. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I think I said coming out of COVID that because it was, I remember like my, my oxygen saturation got down to like 92%, which, you know, and, and it wasn't fun. And I'm somebody who's really healthy. So at that point, I remember, I remember saying to my audience that I felt that people who were at risk should consider, right, the you know, getting the, getting the shot. And mm-hmm. my dad got it because my dad, extremely high risk. And right. I have another member of my family who has another, who has a comorbidity, high risk. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, but this idea that we should just as a blanket mandate that you can't go into restaurants, right? Like, right. You couldn't go into a restaurant in LA without showing your vaccination status. Yes, yes, yes. Just absurd. Insane. Yeah. You know, it really was yeah. absurd and insane. I'm glad it's mm, over, but I still see these people in masks and, <laughs> and outside, like, oh. like by themselves. Yeah. And speaking of which, I have wanted to pick your brain about this. It is the season of cold and flus. Yeah. Tips. What can we do? Like, I mean, I get it. I think I probably get a flu every year at around this time, mm. around Christmas. What do you do? Anything that you do to boost the immune system, the power of the immune system? Yeah, I think you want to try to keep your vitamin D levels up, which can maybe help prevent um, or reduce the duration. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the evidence on vitamin C is pretty limited. 
Uh, I looked into this recently because I had a, I did have a cold fairly recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think vitamin D is probably one that is like is is really important. Um, other than that, I mean, the same to just do the just be the healthiest version of yourself that you can be. Yeah. I do think that we change up our diets because it's the festive season. We go out to more parties, so we're around more people. Yeah. We drink more. We eat more sugar than maybe more sugar than we would usually eat. Mm. That can all have effects on our immune system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like getting a cold to some degree is natural, and it's also not necessarily the worst thing to to challenge your immune system. True. To fight off a cold. True. And you come out on the other side stronger. True. You know, with those antibodies. Yes, that's true. So, I mean... Natural to, immunity? Did you just advocate for natural <laughs> immunity, Max? Wow. I mean, getting getting a cold, it's like part of the, it's like, I never, it's like the people who are like, I never want to be depressed. Well, do you want to be human? Because, right. you know, it's like, yes. you're going to get depressed at some point. You're going to be anxious at some point. Yeah. You can't, you know, the, the sweet isn't as sweet without the bitter. Yeah. So, if you don't want to get depressed and you get depressed, you'll be hating yourself because you'll be depressed and you didn't ever want to be. Yeah. Which would just make things harder. Exactly. <laughs> Who wants that? Yeah. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.